Hello folks, welcome to our Georgia Suburban Homestead. It's time to feed our bees. Charlie's quite the chef. <laughs> Here's some eggs from our chickens outside. And last night I made some chicken um, chili. So Charlie got up this morning and said, let's do huevos rancheros. Yeah, well, you get the broken one. You like yours like shoe leather. Mr. Chef. Not as good as you. Not as good as me. That's because you forget to season it. <laughs> Salt, pepper, a little bit of garlic powder, onion powder, and my secret ingredient is what? Uh, there's the red stuff. Can you show us the red stuff? There's the red stuff. There's the red stuff. That's called Berbere. It's a spice mixture from Ethiopia. That uh, What's that commercial? I put that shit on everything? Oh, ber <laughs> Berbere goes on most things here. All right, looks like, like we're ready to serve. Hey, welcome to our Georgia Suburban Homestead. It's end of January, so your bees, if you've got bees, may be getting a little low on food. Um, we're having a major whiteout up in the northeast, and it's kind of drifted down here. We've got pretty cold weather, probably the coldest we're gonna get this year. Nonetheless, I'm gonna try to feed my bees Maybe it'll get up above freezing and there'll be the break cluster. Um, bees are insects, and you might think insects are cold blooded, and so they can just take cold weather. However, bees are used social animals, which means they work in unison to live as a group. And part of that working as a unit in unison is they will actually keep the temperature inside the hive above ambient temperature. To do that, they need food, just like you would need food. And so they can run through their food pretty quick when the weather turns cold. Well, how do they use the food? Well, they eat the sugar and then they get in there and they vibrate. And as they vibrate, they're using the muscles and the muscles convert that energy into heat. And that as long as they're clustered up together, they will kind of produce a little hot spot and then they kind of shift and the bees on the outside will kind of work their way toward the end and the bees on the inside work their way toward the out and they kind of circulate. And if you got European honeybees, they will maintain the temperature inside the hive around 52 degrees. If you've got African eyes, they maintain the temperature at, at 54 or above and because of that they will go through their food a lot faster which is a good thing actually because it keeps them from going too far north you know the colder the weather the more energy they have to keep using to keep it above that 54 degrees and so they run out of food a lot faster but if you're keeping good bees and you're a good beekeeper you're feed your bees through the year or especially in the winter um, and that's what we're going to do today. So in the winter, the s standard solution is two parts sugar by one part water. Now, people say, well, that's got weight instead of volume, but the bees aren't going to care. Um, what you're trying to do is minimize the amount of water that will need to be evaporated because that cools off the hive. So in the winter you feed two to one, in the summer you feed one to one, because in the summer they may want to cool their hive instead of heat it up. And, you know, purists will say weigh it out. But you don't really have to because there's not a lot of difference. If you add a little extra volume of sugar, you know, then twice the volume of water, then you're going to come close. The other thing people will say is you shouldn't borrow the sugar water. And the reason for that is the sugar water down at the very bottom of the pot under the, in contact with the heat 
my um, the chemical may change a little bit. So the best way to do with that is bring your water up to a boil without any sugar in it, then turn off the heat, put the sugar in, and stir like crazy. And that's what we're going to do today. So first. So how much are you making? Well, I'm going to start with two quarts of water, and then, as I say, you can you can weigh it out or your sugar out, or you can just you know I'll go up and nearly fill this thing with sugar, and the difference is is not enough for the bees to be able to tell, and it all dissolves. Eh, it takes four or five minutes of stirring, but it will eventually all dissolve. And it's thick enough that it won't freeze, and they can pretty much utilize it without any type of changes. So let's get some water. I use regular tap water. Uh, once it comes to a boil, any chemicals in the tap water will pretty much absorb out. You can get all Puritan on it. Hey, Charlie. I all of I all of you. you. I love you. All of you. So we just put it in there and turn on the heat, and we will. Wait for it to come to a full boil. Is that going to be enough for all three hives? I give them... Well, once I put the sugar in, it'll actually come up to about right here. The, uh, the volume increases to about right there. Okay. And I'll get about three quarts, so each hive will get about a quart. And do that every two weeks. Every two weeks? Yeah. Um, toward the end, end of winter you can do it every two weeks um, or you know in the fall you can keep them stocked up um, how much danger is there of them making honey from the sugar water well it's not honey <laughs> they will treat it as if it was nectar as far as they will pull it into their honey stomach add the chemicals to it uh, and stick it into the hive if they've got an excess and giving them a quart at a time is a little excess so they will they will attempt to make it in the honey but everybody pretty much calls that funny honey now some folks are able to put uh, dye into the water like egg coloring you mean the sugar water yes put sugar water dye into the sugar water and then if they see like blue sections of a hive they know that's funny honey Honey, honey. So, I don't do that. When I'm checking them in the spring, um, I regulate the amount of food they get so that they start off, you know, with nothing in the supers. And since there's nothing in the supers, and I only collect from the supers, then I don't get any funny honey. I like to put a little bit of sugar in by hand first because if you try to just pour it in um, you don't have a little weight what you might end up with is a giant spill So you'll do two of those? Two of those. As you see I filled it up just a little higher than the two quart line, which was down about here. But that will keep it from well I'll keep you from knocking it over quite as easily at the beginning. Which is a big mess to clean up. And I might mention that you can overfeed your bees. You might think, well, how the heck do you overfeed your bees? Well, come spring, when nectar flow starts off, the, the queen's going to want to lay eggs. 
produce a, more brood. If you fed them to the point that the hive's full of sugar water, she's got no place to lay. So uh, you do kind of, if you get some nice warm weather in the middle of winter, you can try inspecting and see if they got enough room. But especially, you know, February when it starts turning warmer, you might want to cut back on the feeding just to make sure that the, the queen will have some room to lay in. Otherwise, what happens? Oh, she likes to swarm. <laughs> they say, oh, there's lots of food in here for a, for a new hive to start up, and she and a bunch of her workers go flying off and find themselves someplace else to live. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> because it would take a month or so for that new hive to get to the point where it can start collecting a lot of nectar and by then the nectar flow may be over. Uh, so not only will you lose the qu your queen and half the workers, but you lose a lot of your honey harvest for that year from that hive. Could you explain to us what a nectar flow is? Well the nectar flow is just when a lot of plants start blooming. Um, the, the big nectar flow, the initial nectar flow in this area is probably Floricea, early yellow bush that blooms. Forsythia. Forsythia. But, you know, as it starts warming up, more and more plants start blooming and they're trying to attract the bees, so they're putting out more and more nectar. And that will last for a month, month and a half, depending on where you're at. May not even last up to two months but it's going to decrease during the summer and then you're in what's known as the dearth. There's very little food for them and they're just going to start eating off of everything they collected during the nectar flow. So when do you harvest your honey? I tend to harvest my honey at the end of the um, initial nectar flow and then everything they collect after that through the rest of the winter is theirs as far as I'm concerned. Now a commercial honey grower or honey supplier is going to collect his at the end of the fall. He's just going to stack box on box on box up on that hive and then come winter he's going to take almost all of that off. Um, you know, I'm in it for the hobby and collecting a little bit. I'm not trying to make a living off of it. So I try to work with the bees as much as possible, leave them, you know, a full hive Come in, coming in the fall. How much honey did you get off of that one hive that we named Zaza? Um, Zaza gave me um, probably um, maybe three gallons off of that one hive. That's about what I expect with a good honey flow. Uh, we had some problems this last year and the uh, neighbor contracted with a um, what do they call them? Exterminating. Exterminating company. And they sprayed, um, what is that chemical? Fripanil. Fripanil, which is uh, implicated in colony collapse disorder. A quarter of a nanogram is enough to kill a bee, and even half that, it disorients them where they can't fly or get back to the hive or. Well, it was a mess. There were just so thousands and thousands of bees. On how the many bees did you lose last year? I lost six hives last year. Uh, and they, how, how do we know it was Frippernell? Well, called the Ag Department. The Ag Department came out and inspected, took uh, samples of bees, dead bees, samples of honey, samples of wax, and did chemical analysis, and they found Frippernell. And we knew that a pesticide company had come through the neighborhood door the door selling uh, their their motto or whatever they want to call it was they could kill anything you wanted dead and yeah they killed quite a bit more than just my bees in this neighborhood what else died well we lost a dog neighbors lost chickens a lot of songbirds there's a lot of secondary poisoning from that and clearly they had sprayed it incorrectly because Frippanil is only designed or only allowed to be used in the United States for termite control and uh, 
putting it on your pets for fleas. And bees don't go to people's foundations to collect nectar, and they don't collect nectar off of people's pets. So that company obviously had sprayed it incorrectly. Starting to boil. But it's degassing. Degassing. Yeah. Kind of like you first thing in the morning. Oh. <laughs> I degas all the time. But oh, good lord. <laughs> Gee, Charlie, why does your wife have this on the refrigerator? That's for feeding baby possums that we find dead. Well, when the parents found dead on the road. So what does your wife do with those? She feeds them out, gets them up to a certain size, and lets them go. They're cute little boogers when, when they're young, but they get a little uglier when they get older. But they're I still, do not. They're still a nice animal. They just like to bare their teeth at you to make you think they're mean. Okay. So now we've got a boil. You can see it's more than just some bubbles coming up the side of the pan. You can clearly see it boiling. So at this point, I'll turn off the heat. turning on the stove. I pour it in slowly so it doesn't create a big bubble in there. All gets wet. And then you can, now you can see, you can't see the bottom of the pan, but most of that's already pretty much started dissolving because I'm not filling any grit on the bottom of the pan. Still those little bitty particles are floating around in that water. And you will want to stir it until you can actually see the bottom of the pan. And I use a wooden thing because I'm actually using a non-stick coated pan. We're so technical. Wooden thing. A wooden spatula. Okay, you can see the color changing from bright white to kind of a gray now. A little more storing. Becoming a little more transparent. pour it in too fast you get sugar stuck on the bottom just pour it in there slowly it'll help kind of dissolve as it goes down toward the bottom okay, go. so don't be impatient with it All right and remember the first rule of beekeeping everything's going to get sticky so you don't want to get too fast with your stirring and splatter it out across the stove. Alright, see it's now it's going from the bright white till it's almost black because we're using a black, black coated pan. But you still can't see the bottom of the of the spatula. So it needs a little more stir stirring. It sounds like you're scraping the bottom of that pot as you go. Well, there's some... It's an old pot. <laughs> the bottom, the coating on the bottom did get kind of scraped off at one point. So, I almost see it. A little more stirring. When you're beekeeping, you learn to move slowly. Now, 
Now you can buy some stuff and add to this some essential oils of various herbs and it's supposed to help the bees decide to eat the stuff because sometimes they won't eat the sugar water. If they've got an alternative source, they may go to an alternative source. What's their favorite scent? Well, okay, now you can clearly see the bottom. You can even see the colors in the, in the spatula. So what's their favorite scent, Daddy? Interestingly enough, the stuff I use has a bunch of thymol in it. Uh, Doesn't that fight mites too? Yes, that's what I'm saying is they say it's a feedant. Not only do the essential oils help the bees want to eat, it helps to chase out the uh, other bugs that like to get in and eat the bees' food, especially the small hive beetle. Uh, small hive beetles do not like thyme oil, and so you put a little thyme oil in your feedant, and it helps them helps the bees chase them out of the hive. At what point do you add it after it's cooled off? You can add it when it's hot, but that's just going to make your essential oils evaporate faster. So yeah, I add it when it's after it's cooled back off. So. We can go do other stuff now and let this cool, right? Yep, it'll take about an hour to cool. So we'll be back, y'all. Oops, gotta be. <laughs> the bee follow you in? Yeah, that's good. All right, Charlie, what you got there? I got the, <clears throat> the essential oil. Essential uh, oil. Yes. Can you show it to us? Well, it's a box. Being kind of expensive because those expensive oils are kind of hard to get a hold of. Pro Health. Well, let's see the label. Pro Health, what does that say? 16 U.S. fluid ounces. <laughs> Feeding supplement with essential oils. Helps maintain digestion. One pint. What's in it? Water, sucrose, spearmint oil, lemongrass oil, lecithin, and thymol. The okay, thymol so... Thymol is the thing that smells... The lemongrass, you know, they really like the lemongrass, don't they? Yes, lemongrass attracts them as if it was queen because she puts out a scent that's very similar to the lemongrass scent. So I'm going to have about three quarts, so I'm putting about three tea, teaspoons in. That's going into your sugar water that's cooled off now, right? Yep, relatively cool. That's really good. Put the top back on so I don't hit it with an elbow. And I got the cups lined up here. And there's probably an easier way to do it. I haven't thought of one. You're going to get stuff messy. So I kind of line them up. This way I can kind of make sure they're even. There are lines inside this cup. And every once in a while I'll get them all lined up the same line. But, the first rule of beekeeping, everything's going to get sticky. And since this, you're just going to need to... Have you ever tasted this to see what it was like? Yeah, I have. You get it on your fingers, you know. And, uh, you forgot the middle one. 
Okay. Hey, there are lines in there. No, I'm, I'm in the peanut gallery here. Surprised that bee hasn't come over to you by now. Well, if you accidentally get a bee in your house, what they're likely to do is head for the windows. Um, they orient by the sun, so they want to look for the sun. It's kind of funny when we were bringing a set of bees home from a cellar. A few of them got out. A few of them. There were like 30 of them. Well, that's just a few bees. Not like a whole hive in your car. Well. Yeah, but you should have seen the faces of people when we stopped at stoplights. <laughs> looking out and seeing, <laughs> and seeing these bees clustering on the inside of the windows and you and I just sitting there just as calm as we can be. Yeah. Now, if you ever get pulled over by the police and transporting bees, there's more than likely going to be a few of them get out. Just <clears throat> stop where the sunlight's going to be coming in the passenger, the driver's side window. See how long the cop sticks around? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if the cop walk up with all those bees, in the front window, and see if he's going to ask you to roll the window down. You can always tell them you're making a beeline for home. <laughs> so I've, I've fed all three of them at the same time. You need to feed all your hides at the same time, otherwise one hide gets jealous and they try, try to rob from the other one. You don't want to ever set up robbing, especially in the winter. Uh, if you put the restrictions on the entrance though, they can defend their hive without any trouble. The police are coming around, you can see them on the outside of the container here, trying to get sugar water from the outside. As I said, everything gets sticky and they're going to clean that right off for us. If I accidentally drip some down the side, they're going to get on there and clean it off. Even the girls with pollen in their leg sacks are stopping for a drink. Yep. Let me get, see if I can get in there and film that. Yep. This side keeps knocking the restriction off on me. Y'all see the pollen sacks on the back of that bee that just went down in there? Look for the yellow dots. There's one with pollen. Well, this is late January. Late January, so what the heck is out there giving enough pollen for them to collect it like that? And then you see the bees buzzing. They're hovering and looking at the hive. Those are newly, those are bees that have newly graduated to become foragers and they're setting their internal GPS to be able to go out and collect. Can you see? I get the camera on it. Can you see the girls with the Pollen in those sacks on their legs. See, look at that one. <laughs> Girls be busy. Well, that's all for this day of bee feeding. I'll see you later. Look that way.